as we carry on with our theme of back to basics. Um, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the architects of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, uh, famously, he didn't coin this expression, but he included it in, in a letter written to somebody about the Declaration and what it meant and the, his hope that it would create something permanent. But then he went on to say, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Um, so it's become one of those kind of famous phrases um, and, and it does reflect a reality that's in the world today about, uh, and Jeff reflected on this in, in some of our, our comments shared together, about the concerns that there are in the world. And, you know, sometimes when I've um, introduced talks that touch on this subject of certainty or uncertainty, um, there's, I, I, there's usually been a list of, of things that are going on in the world, global issues and local issues, and you can reel off a list of half a dozen things fairly easily that lead to this sense of there being uncertainty. Well, I, I don't really need to catalogue a list of things, I don't think, because just this one thing for the past almost two years now has created globally massive uncertainty. And that's, of course, the, the whole COVID thing uh, and the virus itself and all the um, restrictions and all the control measures and everything has been introduced in an effort to try and control uh, what is going on. Uh, and all of that and probably a great deal of it is unintended consequence. It creates such great uncertainty in life and uncertainty in life. Uh, inevitably leads on to create fear and anxiety because you, people are uncertain about things so you, you can't you can't kind of plan and you're just not sure what's lurking around the corner what's what's the next thing that's that's going to hit us and right now in terms of covid we've got this this new variant and who knows what that's going to do uh, and what they think about that as yet so all of this uncertainty and, and it creates this kind of fear and anxiety and sometimes even to, to the point of paralysis that we just don't feel that we can do anything and we're kind of stuck where we are. And, and so that's, that's a general thing that, that can be observed in the world. Now you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus, as people of faith, we're not immune from that either, are we? And we can often find ourselves um, feeling similar things about um, uncertainties in life, even uncertainties in spiritual life and in our spiritual experience. It can feed in or leak into, into our perceptions on these things. And when we're thinking about this matter of uncertainty and how it might impact our, our spiritual life, there's, there's one fundamental question which I think besets some Christian people uh, and that is this question and it may be phrased in, in a number of different ways but it's how can I be sure of my eternal salvation? How can I be absolutely certain about it? Because there's lots of things that people will say and different teachings that, that people will say come from the Bible that suggests there can be some doubt over this, that there could be a question mark about how certain you can be about your salvation. So we're thinking, of course, about often this is the expression that is used in relation to this is the truth about eternal security. And that's that's really the, the basic kind of thing that we're thinking of. And, you know, it, it may seem, you know, the whole point of back to basics is to is to revisit some of the things that we are familiar with, things that we know, things that we believe. And this is one of those ones, I'm sure for all of us, it's like, well, why are we even talking about this? Because it's so obvious, it's so true, we don't have any issue about this. Well, we're talking about it because a US survey from 2020, 65% um, of adults identify themselves as Christians. Uh, so there's something to do with that statistic in itself, in terms of, of other previous statistics. But the incredible thing was only a third of them believe that they get to heaven solely through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Which leaves something like 40% of 
self-identifying Christians in the U.S. believing that you that there's something else apart from faith in Christ to get to heaven. And when you dig deeper in the survey, it comes out that even amongst those who claim to be Christians in the US in this survey, and not just this survey, but other surveys as well, they think that it also depends on how you live your life, the things that you do. So it's a works-based concept as well. That yes, maybe faith in Jesus, but I also, have to, I also have to live a good life. And I also have to earn my place in heaven. And that's amongst people who claim to be Christians. And it even extends, of course, beyond those who might claim to be Christians, just the general population, that there is that idea out there. So this is a reality that you and I have come across. Not just amongst people who are not yet believers, but even amongst those who may claim to be believers, that they might not have this assurance and this certainty. You know, the simple answer to the question about being certain of our eternal salvation, of our eternal security, is we can be certain about that because of whom it is based upon. And that's the simple answer. We could pack up now, really, in, in a sense, and leave it at that because of the one who has secured our salvation. That is why, that is why it is absolutely secure. And that is how and why we can be absolutely certain about it. Well, let's explore it a little further for our own uh, encouragement and reassurance. Let's turn to John chapter 14, verse one. The Lord is with his disciples and he says to them, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through me. Again, we could leave it there. <laughs> Jesus says, he's the way. No one comes to the Father, but by me. Let's just turn to Acts chapter 4. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Let's be very, very clear in our understanding and in our statement that there is absolutely no other means of eternal salvation no other means of forgiveness of sins, no other means of securing our eternal destiny, except through believing faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death on Calvary, his resurrection, his ascension. And only our personal belief and faith in that is what secures our forgiveness of sins. And it is something which the Lord himself has declared is absolutely exclusive. And some people get upset about that whole idea that this claim, this line of preaching uh, of Christianity, of, of, of this truth, that it's only through Jesus Christ, it's too exclusive. And it means that, that other ways that are good ways and, and other spiritual ways are excluded. And that's not fair because other people think there's value in these other ways. There may be value in, in some other means for them, but there's no value for forgiveness of sins and for securing our eternal destiny. So the way of salvation is absolutely exclusive, exclusively based upon believing faith, personal believing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Turn to Mark chapter 2, please. Uh, Mark chapter 2, and just breaking in at verse 5, this is a whole story about the paralytic man being brought to Jesus and the hole in the roof, that kind of thing. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And those who were cross with the Lord and accusing him of blasphemy actually hit the nail on the head. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They got it right. Because that's exactly the point. And that's exactly what Jesus was, the point that he was making here. You you. you, you You've seen previously demonstrations of miraculous divine power that can only come from God. And then you get upset when the, the, the Lord, when he says, I forgive somebody their sin on the same basis of divine power and authority. And just to prove to you that I am the one with that divine authority, I've forgiven this man his sins and I'm also going to heal him. And that's exactly the point that the Lord is making. His divine exclusive authority to forgive sins. It's all invested in the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In who? In the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one in whom we can have redemption. Forgiveness of sins, eternal security, the assurance of our eternal destiny, our place in heaven. Only in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has invested in him the grace, the authority and the power to forgive sins. And God has not given that to anybody else or to any other way of belief, any other system of religion or faith or spirituality, only through believing faith in the Lord Jesus. So that's it. Nothing added, nothing taken away. It is as powerful as that and as simple as that as to how we get saved and how we can be assured of our salvation and how we can be absolutely certain about it. It's not achieved by attending church regularly. It's not achieved by how generous we might be to various charitable causes. It's not achieved by whatever status we, we may find ourselves occupying in a, in a church community. By any title, it's not achieved by any religious qualification or anything like that. None of those things, there's benefit in those things in themselves, of course there is, but none of those things in themselves will secure our eternal destiny. They will not achieve our forgiveness. They will not achieve our redemption. And they will not give us the certainty that we can have through faith alone in the Lord Jesus. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews, the, the, the biblical book of Hebrews that we have in the New Testament, um, could rightly be described as the better letter uh, of, of the scriptures, because this word better appears at least 13 times to, to my account, describing uh, things to do with basically the better covenant, the new covenant as we understand it, about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it talks about better promises. It talks about a better sacrifice uh, compared to the Old Testament sacrifices. It talks about a better possession that we can have in terms of uh, an internal inheritance and linked with that a better country, something to look forward to, or a better resurrection concerning the resurrection of Christ and our own resurrection through that and better blood. 
All of these things are related to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And constantly we get this refrain, we get this theme coming through the book of Hebrews that what Jesus has done, what he has achieved, what he has secured, what he has accomplished is better, 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 better than anything that's gone before or anything that could possibly come since. It's the best. And I, and I think it's Luke's version, I didn't check, but I love the expression about the transfiguration where it says there, I think Luke is the one who records it, that the, the Lord was appearing with Moses and Elijah and was speaking about the things which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Not things that he wanted to try and do or hoped to, things that he was going to accomplish as if it was a done deal. Well, it was a done deal. Never any doubt about what the Lord was going to accomplish. And he came and he fulfilled um, all the betterness and fulfills all this description of being better, better, better. And we have this wonderful verse in Hebrews 7 and 25 that says of the Lord Jesus, he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. This word forever, you can take it on, the, on its face value as we understand it from an English point of view, uh, and it has that meaning. It also means completely to the uttermost, absolutely. Nothing lacking, nothing more to be added. He's able to save forever to the uttermost completely. Because what he's done is better than anything else that's ever been done before or ever could be done since. What the Lord Jesus has done in achieving salvation is complete and perfect and forever and needs nothing added to it. And you know, that's the thing which kind of gets me about um, these thoughts about um, people mistakenly believing that they need to do something in their lives then to earn it that they need to do something in addition to believing in the Lord Jesus. Because what the implicit message of that is, whether they realize it or not, what they are saying is, what the Lord has done on the cross is not quite good enough. I've got to do something to make it better. That's the reality of, of that way of thinking. That by my works, by me proving to God that I'm worthy, by living a life that can earn, uh, I'm adding to what Christ has done. And, well, apart from that being so mistaken, there's an arrogance in that as well. I'm sorry to say it, but it's, that's the reality, isn't it? We cannot add. We don't need to add to the work of Christ. It's absolutely complete and perfect for achieving and securing our salvation and our forgiveness of sins. Do you remember the story about... Um, the apostles being in the prison, the Philippian jailer, and the earthquake. And I mean, it's one of those exciting stories in, in, in the Bible, isn't it? About the uh, experiences of the early disciples in the early church. And as the earthquake and as, as Paul and his companions are in, they're in prison. Uh, and their chains fall off and the prison doors are open because of this earthquake. And the jailer comes rushing in and he thinks, everything's lost because everybody's going to escape and that's that's him done for he would pay for that with his life let's just read in acts chapter 16 well verse 27 when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened he drew his sword and was about to kill himself supposing that the prisoners had escaped but paul cried out with a loud voice saying do not harm yourself for we are all here and he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear he fell down before paul and silas and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. What must I do? Is, is what the jailer asked. And basically Paul's answer is you don't need to do anything. You just need to believe. You just need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. And so it's not about doing in the sense of, of, of doing good works or anything like that to achieve our salvation. It's about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's 
That's the simple truth uh, and the simple assurance and certainty that you and I can have. It's unambiguous. It's completely rock solid that our salvation depends upon the power, the authority, the achievement, the integrity of the Son of God. No higher authority, no, no greater person, none other than the divine Son of God is the one who grants us forgiveness upon believing faith in his name. And that then means that it's, that it's absolutely secure. And if it's absolutely secure, then you and I can be completely, utterly, 150 million thousand percent, if there's such a thing, certain of our salvation when we genuinely believe in the Lord Jesus. Once for all is, is another wonderful uh, refrain in the scriptures. So Romans 6 and 10, speaking about the death that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, it says he died to sin once for all. Only once, because only once is necessary, and, and for everybody, there's that aspect to it, but once and for all in the sense of finality as well. Again, Hebrews 7 and 27, um, speaking about offering himself as a sacrifice for sin, and this he did once for all. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin once for all. Never needs to be repeated, doesn't need to be done again. And again, similarly in Hebrews 9 and 12, speaking about um, uh, the Lord Jesus going into the heavenly sanctuary uh, with his own precious blood to provide cleansing and sanctification. He entered the holy place once for all with his own precious blood shed on the cross at Calvary. And then Hebrews 10 and 10, um, speaking about um, offering his own body and the sanctification that comes to us through our faith, that we are sanctified once and for all when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 3 and 18, clearly and simply, Christ died for sins once for all. And what that means, what that finality, what that completion means is there's nothing more to be added. Not by Christ, not by God, certainly not by us, absolutely not by any of us. This is, this is a, a complete, fully accomplished according to the will of God for our salvation, our sanctification, our discipleship. Our, our lives of service then, um, that we have the privilege and the honor and opportunity to live until we realize the heavenly dimension of our inheritance. Some people seem to live their Christian lives under the shadow of this. This is like a cloud, this idea of unless I perform, unless I earn, unless I do good works, I can't be certain. And to have this truth explained, if they haven't had it explained, and if they've not embraced it, surely is such a free, freeing thing for them, releasing them from that cloud of doubt, of uncertainty, and can release them into greater service for the Lord. Uh, and so it can for us as well. But just in case anybody... Um, might not be entirely convinced at this stage uh, through what we've considered together from the scriptures. I suggest the final word on all of this is from the Lord himself in John chapter 10. John 10, 28. Lord Jesus speaking, of course, and he says, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. And you have this just beautiful image, this beautiful truth of being 
in the hand of the Lord Jesus, secure, safe, a refuge, um, knowing that the Lord has the power to hold us in his hand and he's never going to let us go. No one can pry open his fingers and snatch us as if we can lose our salvation or not be certain. Nobody can do that. Not only that, we're in the Father's hand. And it's almost this idea of, of, the, of the hand clasped over the hand, that double security. And that's from, directly from the word of the Lord himself. And surely that has to be the final word and the reality of this truth of our eternal security. How can I be certain of my salvation? Because it's achieved through the Lord Jesus Christ and we will never lose it. Once we sincerely believe with our whole heart and accept Jesus Christ as our savior, that salvation is eternally secure. Our forgiveness is eternally achieved and we will never lose it. Praise the Lord for that. What a great savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe. Oh, uh -huh.